I'd like to call this town meeting to order. Thank you all for coming. I uh, introduce State Representative Bob Gannon, who represents the West Bend area of the state legislature. He's here to answer questions and re respond to concerns about what's going on in Madison. Well, I try to do the same for the federal issues. I want to publicly thank the City of West Bend for its cooperation in setting up this meeting and also local law enforcement officials for their service tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to hear your concerns. In fact, this is the 80th public meeting that I've held since January. You probably know that some of these meetings have become very contentious, so I want to be sure to review the rules we need to adhere to so we can have an orderly environment in which to exchange our ideas. First, I ask all of you to sign in with my staff. If you would like an opportunity to speak, you need to check the speaking box that appears in the sign-in slips. That way I'll know to call on you during the first portion of the meeting. I will be giving priority to those of you who reside in West Bend. And then if time permits, I will continue to call on residents of the 5th Congressional District. If additional time is available, I will call on those that do not reside in the 5th District. This portion of the meeting will last about an hour and 20 minutes. I expect participants to be respectful and to allow the person who is recognized and has the floor the opportunity to speak without interruptions, as well as when I respond to each comment. Further, if the question you would like to ask or the comment that you would like to make has already been made, please refrain from asking it again. We should try to hear from as many of you as time permits within these constraints. If at any time participants become rude or disruptive, I will immediately adjourn the meeting as there is nothing positive to be gained from continuing with a meeting that is disorderly. And regretfully, I had to do that in West Dallas about a month ago. We can disagree without being disagreeable, and signs are okay in this room as long as they are neither disruptive nor obstructive. The second portion of the meeting will be devoted to those of you who seek my help with personal problems that they are experiencing with the federal government. The way I know you would like to speak with me privately about these matters is if you indicate on the very bottom of the sign-in slip. That part of the meeting is an opportunity for us to have a one-on-one -on -one private conversation and it is not the time to continue discussions from the general part of the meeting. Any filming or recording is prohibited during this part of the meeting uh, because a lot of these things relative to personal issues such as medical issues with the VA and that should not be recorded uh, or otherwise uh, distributed. All of that being said, first up is Joan Baumgartner of West Bend. Hello, I'm Joan Baumgartner. Um, I've got a problem with the Trump care that's proposed and I know it's coming up for a vote soon, and what the 10 top points I find problem with is that it takes away health care from roughly 23 million Americans. It's gonna hike deductibles by as much as 1,500 on average. It'll end the federal protections for people with pre-existing conditions. It allows insurance companies to charge older Americans significantly more for their health care. It will cut $834 billion from Medicaid, a program that more than 70 million Americans, half of which our children, rely upon. Put lifetime limits and annual benefit caps back on the table for even those with employer coverage. Make women pay more for health care insurance than men. Defund pub planned parenthood. Harm children with special needs by cutting special education funds for schools and it does all this in order to pay for 600 billion in tax breaks for the wealthy and corporations expected changes for wisconsin re residents on average the premiums in 2018 are expected to rise by 910 dollars total health care insurance coverage losses are expected to be 406 1,600, Medicaid coverage losses, 223,500, employer-sponsored coverage losses, 62,400, individual market coverage losses, 130,900. 
I ask you to commit to voting against any bill that will result in anyone losing coverage. Number two, I ask that you commit to voting against any bill that does not guarantee people with pre-existing conditions that they won't see higher premiums. And thirdly, I ask you to vote against any bill that eliminates, eliminates funding for Medicaid and Planned Parenthood. Well, first of all, the bill that you're talking about was introduced in the Senate on Friday. We have nothing to do with what goes on in the Senate. The House has already passed the bill. Uh, some of the allegations in the House bill are just flat out erroneous. What I will say is the House bill does uh, protect everybody with pre-existing conditions and there are no lifetime or yearly caps on anybody. Uh, we heard you know, from people who are complaining about that when the bill was put together, uh, and we responded to that. Now, what I will say is that if there is no bill that passed and Obamacare keeps on going on, uh, it will fall apart uh, probably within uh, three to five years. Uh, we saw last week that Anthem is uh, not going to be selling Obamacare policies in the Wisconsin market. Since 2014, the premiums under the Obamacare exchanges in Wisconsin have gone up 93%. And there are 115,000 Wisconsin taxpayers uh, that chose not to comply with the individual mandate that is contained in the law and pay the fine to the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, I think a lot of them chose to do so because this was uh, the Obamacare uh, policies were too expensive and the fine was a lot lower than that. So there are going to have to be some changes made. Opposing all changes is going to mean that Obamacare will run its course and run on out and completely collapse. And if it does that, uh, there's an estimate that there will be about 28 million people that will lose their coverage. So we're going to see what the Senate does. The final bill will be written by a Senate House Conference Committee, and that's the bill that uh, is actually going to uh, uh, go to the President for his signature and veto. What I'm saying is that uh, we do nothing on this, and we want to oppose everything that uh, has been proposed, as my Democratic colleagues have done, uh, because they continue to uh, defend a program which is already in the death spiral, death spiral and will fail uh, uh, probably sooner rather than later. Uh, they're hurting the people that they claim to help. I would disagree with that statement, but uh, just for the record, are you in favor of cuts for Medicare, Medicaid, and Planned Parenthood? Well, let me say number one, there are no changes in benefits under Medicare in any of the bills. And both the Senate and the House bill, there are changes to Medicaid. And the reason there have to be changes to Medicaid is that if nothing is done to Medicaid, within the next 10 years, the cost of Medicaid will double. And uh, that is simply unsustainable, and there will be charge back to the state legislatures that can't print out money and don't have unlimited borrowing because the states pay about 40% of the cost of Medicaid. And yes, I do favor defunding Planned Parenthood. It's the largest abortion provider in the country. I am pro-life. I have made no bones about uh, that fact. And uh, uh, while we do have the Hyde Amendment, money is fungible, and you can move money from one account to the other. So yes, I... 97% of what they do is supply health care for poor women and men and families. Well... 97% of their care is not abortion. Okay, what I will say is the money that Planned Parenthood gets will be transferred to community-based health centers. Uh, they, uh, the community-based health centers, uh, they do not involve themselves in abortion, and there are many more community-based health centers for poor people than there are Planned Parenthood facilities. So we're going to have, you know, much better targeting of the money, and we're not going to get involved in the abortion debate. Uh, Jody, is that Atlin? Allen. Oh, Allen, okay. Poplar must have. I'm 65 years old. I've been paying into Social Security all that all my working life. And I would like to know why Paul Ryan, the Republican Party, and many people in Congress claim that 
Social Security and Medicare is an entitlement when I've paid into it, okay? My question to you is, rather than cut Medicare or even try to privatize it, why not have Congress pay back all the money that they have borrowed from that fund or at the very least, Increase the cap on income, the 120 income up to 200. I personally fall, our family income falls within that range. As an individual in West Bend, I don't mind paying more. And I wanted to know if you would, uh, rather than support Ryan's uh, idea of privatizing Medicare and Social Security, if you would actually support raising that cap. Okay. Number one, there has not been a vote on privatizing <coughs> Medicare or Social Security in the Congress. Uh, I doubt that there will be. I said in response to the earlier question that the health care changes that are being debated in both the Senate and the House do not change Medicare benefits, period. Now, you know, with respect to the, the Medicare part of the payroll tax, there's no cap on that. Um, and uh, from dollar one to whatever dollars of wages, they are all subject to the 1.5% times two uh, Medicare tax. With regards to the traditional Social Security program, which is the old age survivors and liability uh, uh, payments, there is a cap on that. And the reason there is a cap on that is when the Supreme Court held Social Security to be constitutional in 1937 by a 5-4 to four vote, they said that people's benefits from Social Security had to relate to the amount of money that was paid in. So if you raise the cap from 125000 to 200000 people who fall into that category, you know, are going to get a significantly increased Social Security benefit. And that is what goes along with that. If you raise the cap and freeze the benefits, and the whole issue of whether Social Security is constitutional or not will be relitigated. And that is a risk I do not wish to take. Mark Allen, same address. Yeah, uh, my name is Mark Allen. Uh, I have two quick questions. Uh, the first uh, has to do with the Affordable Health Care Act that's been passed by the House and the Whatever, whatever the Senate is calling their uh, proposed Health Care Act. Uh, you said that, oh, that'll come back into the uh, conference committee if they pass a bill and we'll fix things that are wrong with it at that point. And in reality, uh, Speaker Ryan can bring the bill from the Senate and immediately subject it to a voice vote on the floor of the House without committee, without any conference. Would you oppose that move? Well, the Constitution says you get a roll call if one sixth of those present demand one. There will be a roll call on it. Mm -hmm. What I can say is that when Obamacare was passed uh, uh, in uh, 2010, uh, the, you know, the Senate bill was accepted without going to a conference committee. And that was a decision that was made by Pelosi and uh, uh, the leadership of the House at that time. You know, I cannot predict what type of a motion will be made when the bill comes over uh, from the Senate. My guess is that it will go to a Senate House conference committee. And when it goes to a Senate House conference committee, if they are able to reconcile the, the versions then it goes to an up or down vote in the House and cannot have any amendments. The committee consideration provision uh, under our rules is finished when the House passes the bill. Correct. Would you support an up or down on the House, the Senate bill as it comes to you? Well, I want, you? I want to see what's in the Senate bill. Don't we don't know what's going to be in the Senate bill. McConnell issued a proposal. Uh, I don't think it's got the votes now, so they're going to be seeing how to get enough people to uh, get the yes on this. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I've learned to try to predict what the Senate does as an exercise in futility. So, but you would support 
the question was, would you support the maneuver that Nancy Pelosi did with the Affordable Health Care Act? I, I, would, I would prefer a conference committee, but, you know, the leadership, could you please stop wandering around? It's very distracting. Just do your reporting from one place, sir. Uh, uh, you know, that it is, how bills are presented to the House is determined by the leadership. You know, the thing is, is if the bill comes back from the Senate and the leadership chooses not to go to a conference committee, it's still subject to a vote. Mm -hmm. And you would vote? I can't say how I vote okay. because I don't know what's in it. I'm not Nancy Pelosi saying we have to pass it to see what's in it. Remember hey, she hey, said hey, that? Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. yeah. Flo Moran and Timblin Drive in West Bend. Hi, I have two quick questions so that everyone else will get a chance. Last year, the pharmaceutical companies in this, in this country made $12.5 billion dollars in um, income. And now, which and company was that? It was a combined, all of them. They made one point. They made $12.5 billion in profits. In the bill that's on the Senate floor right now, there's a $28 billion tax cut for the pharmaceutical companies. And I wonder how you could, in your head, moralize that and think that that's a good you know, thing. Again, that's the Senate bill, and the House doesn't consider Senate bills until they're passed by the Senate. Would you be against that or for that? Well, I said I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to make a decision until I see in exactly what form the Senate passes the bill. Uh, it would be premature and irresponsible on my part uh, uh, to make that kind of a prediction because uh, the Senate's doing their negotiating now, and uh, um, you know. Uh, I would guess the bill is going to be amended and how it's going to be amended and what it's going to be amended on. I have no way of predicting, and I have no say in that as a House member. Okay, my second question is, I'd like to very respectfully ask you, in your soul, can you tell me that you believe President Trump has the mental capacity morality, honesty, and psychological characteristics to keep his job? The answer is yes, he has that. And the voters chose him to do that. And I respect what the voters did. He will be our president for the next three and a half years. Melissa Bublitz of Great Forest in West Bend. Good evening. I just have two comments. As a Roman Catholic, I stand with Planned Parenthood. You know, good and well, that no federal funds go for abortion. Two, the Senate bill that health care bill that is proposed is not a health care bill. It's a tax cut for the wealthiest Americans. As a middle income earner, I would pay more tax to make sure that there's funding for Planned Parenthood, for Medicare, and for Medicaid. Thank you. Thank you. Judy Stillmacher, Town Line Road, West Bend. Hello. First of all, thank you for being here this evening. I know not all uh, leadership, Congress people and senators are willing to do town halls and appreciate you being here. My comment is similar to a couple that have been here, so I'll just make this point is, I have to ask, does it bother you that both bills proposed for the replacement of Obamacare will cut off so many millions of Americans from health care. Does that bother you? Let, you know, let me say that everybody was supposed to be covered by Obamacare, and they're not. And I gave some statistics earlier about the 115,000 <coughs> people who ignored the individual mandate and paid the fine. Uh, and the fine, I guess, is a lot less than the cost of the Obamacare policy. What I also can say is that if Ob the Obamacare exchanges completely collapse, there will be more people left without health insurance uh, than any of the estimates on any of the replacement uh, for uh, Obamacare. Uh, so, you know, what I can say is, you know, we're, we're, we're not talking about hundred percent or zero percent, we're trying to figure out how to put together a plan 
that will be attractive for people who are low risk and medium risk individuals to go buy into. And that's where the, the biggest failure of Obamacare, you know, has been uh, on that. And you look at the number of people who have, you know, simply, simply paid the fine. Uh, that was their choice uh, and, you know, they had to, to live with that. Now, you know, all of that being said, you know, I think one of the goals is first to guarantee that insurance is available for everybody. And that's why what has been talked about in the Senate and what was passed by the House uh, has no exclusions for pre-existing conditions. The original drafts of the bill that came out a while ago uh, did allow insurance companies to go back to where things were and exclude pre-existing conditions. Can't do that anymore. Same thing as for lifetime you know, or annual caps. Now what that does is, you know, that increases the cost of insurance uh, because it's people with pre-existing conditions that usually have some pretty significant uh, claims that the insurance has to pay for. So we have to figure out what to do to make sure that the cost of insurance for the low and medium risk people is attractive enough that they will want to buy it. And, you know, that's part of the, the, you know, the heated debate on that. Because any type of an insurance program, whether it's homeowners insurance or auto insurance, is risk sharing. And you have to have low risk people uh, uh, in the pool <coughs> in case they have a fire and get an accident so that the cost for the higher risk people is not exorbitant. And that that's where Obamacare is, fa is failing, and that's what we're trying to address. But that was Obama's uh, point with the mandate, that the low-risk people would be part of the pool if they were required to participate. Well, they are required to participate, and in this state, 115,000 people elected to pay the fine when uh, they filed their income tax return. You know, I don't have the figures with me on what the nation a wide figure is, but I've had people come into these meetings, you know, <laughs> saying, you know, look, we got, you know, an $800 to $1,200 a month premium. Uh, we've got an annual deductible of three to $6,000, so, you know, sometimes higher than that. And if you have $800 a month premium times 12, that's 9600 and $5,000 deductible, that's almost $15,000 that these people have to pay before they can collect a nickel uh, when they file a claim. It and that, that's, that's what the problem is because people look you know, at their own finances saying, this is not a good deal for me, so why don't I just ignore the law, pay the fine, you know, and you know, go on with my life and hope that I don't wrap my motorcycle around the tree sometime. You know, I think that's irresponsible because people uh, buy insurance to protect their assets. You know, that's what, that's what it's all about, but when you come up with a package that says, okay, you got these premiums, you know, you got the deductible, and then you pay $15,000 out of pocket, and we'll start looking at your first claim, that is an offer that is very, very easily refused, and we have a large number of people in our state that have said, ain't a good deal for me, I'll pay the fine. That's what we've got to get after, and... Uh, you know, the way Obamacare has been set up, it doesn't work. And, you know, since 2014, the individual Obamacare policies in Wisconsin have gone up 93% uh, in that. So the, the premiums have gone on up, and we don't have uh, the premium schedules for 2018 yet. They're coming out relatively shortly. I don't think with the tax cuts to the wealthy, that you'll see better premiums for those people going forward. But without the ta without the tax cuts, the premiums are getting worse, and you know oh. that that's got that's got to be addressed. <laughs> Andy Poodle, Gilbert Circle, West Bend. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you. Last time you were here, Congressman, you addressed that very issue, which she was just asking about, the increase in the premiums. In the fair market, that's destroying those premiums because. You admitted that the premiums are going up because everybody's pulling out. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're going up, and you said that last time around. Yeah, we've got one of the biggest insurers announcing that they're pulling out. 
Exactly. Yeah, last week. That's right. The free market is what's causing those improvements. Those premiums to go up since 2014. Mm -hmm. So here's my question. Um, how do you adjust your thinking to account for people in the fifth CD with viewpoints that are unlike yours? This is just for you because I already know how represent again and things. Well, I've been one that tells it as it is. You know, I have meetings like this. I don't sugarcoat uh, uh, things. Uh, what I can say is, is that uh, a year ago I would have said, you know, no way should any replacement for Obamacare have a ban on pre-existing conditions exclusions and uh, have a ban on annual or lifetime caps. I changed my position on that because of what I've heard at these meetings. But at you know at the same time, uh, you know, keeping Obamacare you know is on the road to ruin. And you know, the sooner we're able to get to dealing with a replacement for Obamacare, the fewer people will be hurt. Well, I appreciate that. You're, what you're saying is that you are adjusting your thinking based on the constituents coming out and yeah. poisoning their opinion. Representative Gannon told me that if I wanted to be represented by him, I should move to a different district. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> well, I think you. No, missed. that's a joke. That is a direct quote. Say that one more time so it's clear. You what said, you just said didn't make sense. You said if I wanted to be represented, I should move to a different district. If you want me to vote the way you no, think. No, you said if you wanted to be represented. Now, you should now represent remember I talked about the interruptions. Mr. Yeah. Gannon will respond to what you said. So basically, if you don't like my position, you'll have to get somebody else in my position, or you would have to move. That's correct. Because we are a representative republic. We do not each get a vote. I have 58,000 people I represent, and they must be satisfied with how I'm rep representing them by a majority vote. So I'm sorry, there are going to be people I represent that do not like my position. And like I told you, don't like my position. Go out, pass your nomination papers, get me out of office, put somebody else in office. But no, you do not get a vote. It's a representative republic. I am your representative. So what you're saying, and I'm hearing this very well, is that a representative republic is broken because the way our districts have been drawn in this state, completely gerrymandered, we have in 2012, we had 52% vote Democratic, and what did it go, 65% in the Assembly for Republicans, or 61%. So the districts need to be readjusted. So what I would like, this is my request of you, is to have districts drawn that are as equal as possible. Obviously, we live in West End. It's going to be only so equal. The Supreme Court is going to rule on that in the next session. They've taken the case out, and I'm very happy they've taken it. Let's see what the Supreme Court says about districting. They've taken the Wisconsin case. Many other states have joined in. Other states are standing by and watching to see what happens. But for your information, when you say you don't get a vote in this district, this vote, district voted, I believe, 79% for Congress, my district, for Congressman Sensenbrenner. The district has said what their political thinking is, and it's similar to mine. It's similar to Congressman Sensenbrenner. So I'm sorry. If, if you're thinking outside of the where I think, no, you probably are not being represented because I I'm, I wasn't elected so you're for, the, that, for the minority. So you're saying that you will not adjust your thinking whatsoever based on my Sir, beliefs. I listen to everybody. I voted against 61 Republicans this week. I, I am a very independent thinker. I am I am what I call a Republican independent libertarian. So if anything in those make you happy, I, I had a picture taken with the Madison Liberals this week from the State Assembly because they're so thrilled that I vote with them. I am as independent as they come. You come up to me with a good idea and you'd be surprised. I'll be on your side. So I think redistricting, we don't have to wait for the Supreme Court. You can just put that forth. Um, um, there's no need to. Why, wait, why waste all that time and money in the Supreme Court? Well, I, I would just point so out there. that uh, you know, Milwaukee is heavily Democratic. The suburbs are heavily Republican. I don't know what you do about it, you know, unless you, you know, reach yeah. down into Milwaukee and, you know, you know, yeah, which would ha which would have, you know, more obtuse shaped districts uh, uh, there. You know, this this country has never gone for the notion of proportional representation, you know, which has been the case in some European countries like Weimar Germany and Italy that it, uh, didn't have very functional governments. And you look at what happened. We, we, elect, we elect one representative per district at the state and federal level, and 
uh, districts change, uh, people's minds change, elections change. There's really good computer programs out there. I'm sure someone could figure it oh, out. Oh, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I could, I could make you a map that probably had every district in the state 50-50 and it would make Mr. Rorschach's test look easy to decipher and compare. I'm not naive. I don't believe that that would be, well, that that would be, make sense. Doug, Doug Regal yeah. of Timberline Drive. Thanks for letting me out. I thought that was rude. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Regal. Uh, good evening, uh, Congressman. I want to thank you for, for holding these meetings. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, uh, just want to say thank you. I'm here with the, uh, with the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, you've been a, a great supporter of this year. You, uh, in the, uh, in the budget, you uh, helped to pass a $400 uh, million dollar increase to funding at the National Institutes of Health, and you've been a co-sponsor of the uh, HR 1676 Petita Act, which is still grinding its way through, but we appreciate your support and everything you've done to uh, to help the association and, and help uh, weed out this uh, this horrible disease, and uh, just wanted to say thank you for being here. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Weston, Cherry Street, West Bend. Good evening, thank you. <clears throat> I am the administrator for Cedar Community Home Health and Hospice, and I am always concerned with all cuts to Medicare and Medicaid mm -hmm. and the services that we provide our patients. Um, I regularly read through the NAC, which is a National Association of Home Health and Hospice Care, about how our services uh, may be impacted, obviously, which is a concern for our patients and families that we serve. Uh, these are very two very important programs. Um, I've sent emails to you and to Tammy Baldwin and to Ron Johnson, and now you're going to be on my list too, Mr. Gannon, um, to have you come and shadow our staff uh, so you can see firsthand the importance of these services and so you can meet with your constituents to get their feelings on the services that we provide as well. Um, I would only ask that you please keep a watchful eye and encourage you to visit our organization as a whole and accompany our very dedicated staff. Um, after all, you never know when you or one of your family members may be in need of our services. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, let me see, I'm in Washington five days a week, so that makes, you know, the things tough to schedule since I'm usually here only on the weekends. but. Uh, uh, my Wisconsin schedule is handled by Matt Olson in my Brookfield District office. I can't be very positive because we've got lots of things and it takes lots of time. And my first job is to be in Washington uh, doing the job I was elected to, which means voting when the House is in session. We're 24-7. We're yeah. weekends and holidays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So much. Very court, West Bend. I just had a question on why you're trying to cut the time frame short on this health care act. Uh, you know, as far as uh, it seems like it almost has to be immediate. Why not get it right and then? Well, you know, you know, you know. Let let me say that between the time the Ryan bill was introduced and the time it was passed by the House of Representatives, there was about a month that elapsed. Uh, in terms of the scheduling for the Senate, uh, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, who is also the author of the Senate version of the bill, you know, he's the one that is setting the schedule. He will have to answer for that. You know, I, you know, don't set the Senate schedule, and I certainly, <coughs> we in the House of Representatives aren't responsible for what the Senate does. We're the people's house. They're the House of Lords. Okay, and I got a, another question on that. Uh, I had read some articles in Forbes about uh, Ryan, part of it, or the Senate bill on Medicaid, where the, uh, the uh, payment would be equal all the way across on the income scale instead of a rising scale. Like, say, if you were making 20000 to someone making 60000 they would be on an equal percentage scale. Well, you know, for, you know, first of all, let me say that under the existing program, uh, the states determine with caps set by the federal government what the income and asset limitation for Medicaid recipients are. So that's 
uh, over by Mr. Bank and Mr. Gannon and his colleagues. Um, what is done in the House pass bill is that there are there's a choice that each state has to make. They can continue with the present system, which would be on a per capita basis with a uh, kicker based upon the increase in the cost of living for health care, which is computed by the Department of Labor. Or they can go to a block grant and not have any of the federal regulations at all that each state can make its determination if they choose the block grant on what kind of a program is best for their citizens. But this is a decision that's going to be made in Madison and 49 other state capitals if the House to get passed bill uh, ends up becoming law uh, rather than being made by a regulation of the Department of Health and Human Services so, in D.C. So each state will have their own regulation. If they, if they go the block grant route, if they keep on with the current categorical per capita grant route, you know, then there's going to be the federal state cost sharing uh, uh, on that and the federal regulations that go along with that. And one other question. Uh, this seems to be rather a hot button issue throughout the country. Uh, are you going to recess in like a few weeks again for another month's vacation? Or are you going to stay in Washington? Uh, you know, it um, seems like it's kind of a critical... Uh, well, you know, that is yet to be determined, you know. But let me say this, you know, my kids are grown, and, you know, I don't care if I'm staying in Washington or not. I would say over two-thirds of my colleagues, you know, have kids that are in grade school and high school, and they are entitled to have a, a reasonable family time because these jobs are absolutely toxic to families. And if they can't be with their family sometime during the summer vacation on, of school, you know, they, you know, they end up having a real, real problem. And believe me, moms and dads, you know, are essential if kids are to grow up and be good. And, to, you, know, uh, to, you know, to stay in Washington uh, uh, just for the purpose of staying in Washington rather than accomplishing uh, uh, something, you know, I think we ought to have the recess. If there is something that can actually be passed during the summer, uh, the recess resolutions allow the speaker and the majority leader in the Senate to call us back, and I think that that's probably the best of, of both worlds. And that's, I was just you know, kind of curious about that because it seems like uh, you know you, you could be spending some time there. This is a you know a critical thing. Whenever you work in industry or wherever you are. Well, sometimes you have to put in uh, have to well, pay your duty. Well, you know, if you work in industry or you work practically any place else, you get a vacation. You know, that goes along with the territory. That goes along with the territory. And, you know, what we do now is we have three weeks in session and then we have a week of a district work period. Now, I can tell you this is two full-time jobs 700 miles apart. And, you know, and if you think that the only time we're working is when we're out in session debating, that's wrong. If you keep us in Washington, we're not back here. And we don't have, you know, the opportunity to get input uh, from our constituents. And you've got to have, you know, some kind of a balance on, on this. And then again, you know, my kids are growing, so I don't have a dog in that fight. But, you know, believe me, if I had a bunch of teenage boys, you know, they need to have a father uh, so that they can grow up and be good citizens. And if you look at the places where the father is absent, uh, you know, the, the delinquency, the criminal rate, uh, the drug use rate is much, much higher. Uh, you know, the thing is, I'm on call, I'm on call, I'm, on, I'm, I'm answering your question, sir. I'm on call 24-7. I don't mind being out there in Washington. However, there are going to be a lot of people who want to see their kids sometime during the summer vacation, you know, who would. And I think you better think of, uh, you know, the, the, the type of family situation you have when dad's out in D.C., you know, uh, practically all, all the time debating and voting on issues. But you had eight years. Could I ask Mr. Gannon a question? Uh, sure. Well, on that drug, you know, there's been word around they want to do drug testing. 
welfare recipients on that? Yes. We've asked for, I believe we've asked for a waiver. I know we've asked for a waiver. Yes? Is that something that is coming to fruition or is it just a... Congressman, do you know where we're at with getting for approval by the feds? No. No. We don't know yet. We have asked for permission, and we are not alone, I don't believe, in some of the uh, things we've asked for. Just so you know, the drug testing for, for welfare recipients, and I think we've taken it further for our unemployment, on the unemployment you self-report. You say, as part of collecting unemployment benefits, that you're able and willing to go to work in exchange for the government giving you money. Well, one of the questions is, are you doing drugs? Because then you're not able to go to work. So what your government will do, then, is give you free drug addiction services to try to clean you up. You still get your unemployment check, you still get taken care of, and we're going to try to make you whole and healthy and a, and a fully producing member of society. I see nothing wrong with it. Same thing with the welfare benefits. We're not throwing anybody off of benefits because they're, because they're on I, I, We're going to clean people up and make them available. We have a 3.1% unemployment rate. Our problem is no longer jobs. Our problem is healthy, happy, workforce ready people. So we're going to take people that aren't workforce ready and make them. Yeah. I just ask you one: Do they drug test politicians? As a matter of fact, I don't know that. I, just, of, I don't know. I'm, I don't get drug tested, but I'd be happy to give you a test. I, I don't. I'm a, I don't I'm, what, I'm a recovering alcoholic for the last 11 years. I haven't had a drug. I haven't had a nicotine. I haven't had a darn thing. So I. Give you a urine sample. If you'd like a urine sample, I'll give you one on the way out of here. Uh, I don't believe this. Well, okay, uh, Mark. Let's okay. Not go any <laughs> uh, Mark Rantz uh, of uh, is it Hans Court or Hans Street, West Bend? Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Proud member of the Deplorables. Back in May, Harvard University did a study of the media coverage of Trump's first 100 days in office. Both CNN and NBC had 92% negative stories, CBS 91%, New York Times 87, Washington Post 83. My question is, when will the establishment Republicans grow a spine and defend this president? Well, I think I've been doing it all night. I haven't heard it. I'm sick and tired of you guys sitting on your hands, not defending this guy, because it looks to me like you guys want him to fail. No, I don't, I I don't want Trump to fail. I, I don't want any president to fail, because when a president fails, our country fails. You know, what I can say is I have been defending uh, the policies that the president supports uh, all night, and I've done that at the previous 79 meetings, whether they're covered by the news media you know, or not. Uh, you know, what is being done by the mainstream media is they've gotten off on unrelated topics to the issues that are facing our country. Uh, I'm talking about the issues that are facing our country. The president has supported repeal and replacing Obamacare. I have spent most of this evening and most of the previous meeting defending why we have to do that and what we're doing is good. And what we're doing has been endorsed by the President of the United States. I pay close attention to any defenders of this President, and they are few and far between. I don't see your name ever mentioned in a newspaper article, no interviews on TV. Same with Mr. Johnson or Senator Johnson. This is, this is really, this is deplorable, and, and uh, my feeling is, well, you establishment guys, it just it seems, at sir, least for many of us that voted for Mr. Trump, it seems that you guys want him to fail. No, want, I don't. You want to back into the good old boy network that you've always had. No. Because he doesn't fit in. And Johnson's back. Yeah. And Johnson's back. I back him in me. Johnson backs him in me. Oh, but in now, now, you know, it, every week, my comms director sends out a weekly column. Very rarely are they printed, but they have defended the Republican position, which includes the president's position. Now, it's not that I'm not silent about this, it's I'm talking about it, but I get uh, uh, basically uh, taken out of this, and the only time we get TV cameras <coughs> in the back of these meetings is when people want to scream and yell at me, and that's what's happened ever since uh, Trump was inaugurated. Now, I, this is my 80th meeting. I have stood up to people who 
didn't vote for me, will never vote for me. Many of them are here, and I respect them, you know, on that. But the fact is, is that I can talk, but only the people who come to these meetings are hearing what I have to say, unless you have a TV station or a newspaper that actually comes and reports on what these meetings are. And good luck getting Milwaukee TV going west of 35th Street unless there's a big uh, car wreck or a bad fire somewhere out here. And that seems to be what gets covered. Well, I don't always agree with you, but I've always voted for you because the alternative is pretty scary. The media is, is giving the marching orders to the Democrat Party, telling them exactly what to publicize and what they should be screaming about. They have, they have no, uh, no free thought in that Democrat Party. Mike Cahill, Hickory Street, West Bend. Yeah. Well, I'm going to take a pass, but I will be writing. Thank you. <laughs> it is this R. Cahill, same address. Well, actually, these ladies have expressed my views very well. I would just pick up on one thing that I heard, and that was the pro-life. I would like to suggest that the uh, putting severe cuts into Medicaid is also a form of not pro-life because those programs actually support a lot of special needs children and such, and so I would hope that that would be kept in mind okay. if those things are considered. Well, let's define a cut, okay? The way I was taught in second grade math, that a cut is if you spent less next year than you do this year. Now, Washington speak calculates things differently. Uh, under the projection, the cost of Medicaid will double in the next 10 years. Double. That's not sustainable, and I don't think we have the money to pay for it. You know, without borrowing a lot, we may end up having a debt crisis. What is being proposed in both the Senate and House bills is that the increase will be 50%. That's spending half as much over the next 10 years as we spent in the last 10 years. That is not a cut. Now, there have been, you know, it's a cut from, you know, what would, what would happen if we didn't do anything on that. But the question is whether we can afford it. And the answer to that question, in my opinion, is no, because we already spend 60% in mandatory spending programs, which some call entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and another 7% in interest on the debt, which we have to pay. And the remainder is what we call discretionary spending. Now, as the mandatory spending goes up, the amount available for discretionary spending, which is everything else, gets squeezed tighter and tighter and tighter. And if we don't do something about the mandatory spending program, we're going to have no money for discretionary spending at all within the next 25 years or so, and that's going to be very bad. Now, you know, I don't think <coughs> that by voting the increased Medicaid spending by 50% is a cut. I think that if you look at the various line items of the budget, there are very few line items, including Social Security, that will go up by 50%. I think the 50% increase is a generous one, and I think it is affordable. A 100% increase uh, is not affordable. So we have to figure out, you know, what to do that's affordable. And basically the bottom line is balancing out between the mandatory spending and the discretionary spending. And I'd like to see some money available for discretionary spending as well. And we won't have that available if we don't address the mandatory spending. Uh, I'll just add that I would go along with supporting a little bit of the tax increase and fewer tax cuts. Okay. Jim Gilbreth, Old Hickory Place. Good evening, Congressman. Thanks for coming to West Bend. Um, my question's kind of been already dealt with, so if I could switch gears and ask Representative Dan and Trip. Um, can you tell us where things are at with regard to the roads and transportation yeah. in the state of Wisconsin? Yeah. <laughs> you sure you don't have a question for the Congressman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. The state budget is still in flux. I would assume we're going to come to an agreement in this next week, 10 days. Um, and it'll be signed. The good news for Wisconsin, if it is good news, is we do continue. The budget is July 1 for the biennium, but we do continue on the old budget until the new one is signed. So everybody on the payroll gets paid. We don't shut down. 
there's no shutdown if it goes a week or two longer. The assembly position is that your governor's bonds too much money. The, the governor's budget has $500 million of bonding, half a billion dollars. Um, the assembly's been fighting to try to turn, they're trying to find a leadership that's looking for a revenue source. I am of the opinion that you don't spend money you don't have and putting it onto the, the backs of our children. So we'll see what comes out of this. The Senate's position is the governor's position, which is we just continue as it is. And uh, I don't know what the answer is there because we're paying back less than we're borrowing, so the amount of borrowing is increasing. Um, the good news is, based on our nationwide peers, Wisconsin Transportation Fund is fine. It is something, though, that you need to come. You need to come to a solution at some point because the expenses are going up. They're, they're <coughs> care of them. But overall, we are actually. Don't anybody scare you that our roads are going to turn to gravel and dust. It's not going to happen. Debbie Shedpelsky. Did I pronounce it right? You did. Bittersweet Drive in West Bend. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. Um, every a lot of people. Most people have talked about the health care. And I hope that that impresses on you how important everyone thinks that it is. Um, I've been a social worker in the hospital most of my career. Now I'm at Cedar Community and their home hospice program. I can say that the Affordable Care Act is not perfect. However, I spent many years working with people who had no insurance. And the ramifications of that were horrible. With the Affordable Care Act, that was much less. More people had insurance, more people could come and get the health care that they needed when they needed it. They didn't need to wait to have a condition that they could go to the doctor for and maybe get an antibiotic. They didn't have to wait until it got so severe that they ended up in the emergency room in the intensive care unit. So it's not perfect, but it was working. Um, I believe that some, one of the reasons that some of the insurance companies are pulling out at this time is a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen yes. with, the, with the bills that are being put forward. So that's one comment. The other comment I'd like to echo the ladies and gentlemen ahead of me in that Medicaid is a program that helps the poorest children. It helps disabled adults and the poorest elderly people. Many people who live in nursing homes, assisted livings, being cared for in their homes, are doing so because of Medicaid. As the baby boomers get older, that's not gonna get better. It's going to increase. We've talked about tax cuts to the elder, or to the wealthiest people. No one has brought up the incredible amount of money that we spend on defense. No one ever talks about decreasing that budget. There's always enough money. It's where are our priorities. And I would like to challenge both of you that a true pro-life person is looking after the interests of the most vulnerable. And that's what Medicaid does. Thank you. Let me say, I think it is regrettable that the debate on Medicaid is in with the same debate on health care. You know, health care, we're talking about a policy, uh, we're talking about insurance. Medicaid is a welfare program. It was passed as a welfare program. It still is a welfare program. And I think we would have been ahead by decoupling the two and debating them separately rather than, you know, kind of making them Siamese twins that are joined at the hip. But they do both pay for health expenses. Yeah, I know they both pay for health expenses, but you know, Medicaid is a welfare program and it was passed that way in the 60s and the expenses have gone out of control. <coughs> and something has to be done about that. And I referred to you know this this earlier, you know, a doubling of Medicaid expenses in 10 years. You know, that's not sustainable when you've got a $20 trillion uh, national debt. You know, what I can say also is that, you know, defense is discretionary spending. And, you know, with the budget agreement that was reached between President Obama and the Republicans in Congress in August of 2011, 
the Defense Department was sequestered uh, when there was overspending uh, on that. So there has been more control of the increases, uh, and there have been very few of them, of defense spending than there have been with the so-called mandatory spending or entitlement programs, depending upon what you, you want to say. You know, you know, with the baby boom generation retiring, you know, and a lot of people who have been paying in now reaching the age where they start collecting benefits, you know, we are suffering from the same thing that every industrialized country in the world is suffering from, and that is an aging society with advances of medical care, people are living longer, a lot of them are retiring earlier, and that's, I think, good for the quality of life for millions of people. It's not good for the people who balance the books and retirement programs and, and stuff like that. We've got to be honest on this, you know, and we can't say that what we've been doing now will continue forever because if we don't have people buying our government bonds, then the Treasury and the Fed are going to print up money, and that's inflationary. And if we have 10% inflation, that's kind of like a sales tax that no politician has to vote for and everyone can run against. And I remember when I started out, we had double-digit inflation in this country, you know, and uh, if you wanted to get a mortgage on your house, the best rate you could get is 22%. So the housing market was put in a deep freeze. And there were a lot of people who you know, were put out of work, the unemployment rate went up, and I fear what will happen if we ignore these financial situations with the deficits that we've been running because sooner or later we're going to get to the end of our rope and the whole country is going to get hurt as a result of it. Uh, Robert Fitz, County Road Z, West Bend. Yes, good evening. Uh, I just want to say, I echo the comments of the previous speaker. Thank you, very intelligent. Uh, you indicated that you voted for the House bill, which did cut back Medicaid. And you indicated that. No, sir, it did not. It increased Medicaid by about 50% over the next 10 years. It's decreasing, okay, so it's decreasing the. Uh, funding for the it decreases the growth rate, right. but we're still spending 50% more yep. in 10 years than we are now. Okay, so it's still going to decrease the uh, health care for poor and disabled. No, it will not do that. We're spending more money on the poor and disabled, not as much more money, you know, as some people want. But it's not a cut. When you increase spending by 50%, that's not a cut, except in terms of Washington math. You know, Washington math has given us a $20 trillion national debt, and that means we're spending money on ourselves and having our children and grandchildren ending up paying for it. And that's that's the effect of it. Okay, so the, so the next question is to have is, in order for ultimately getting a health care bill that anyone can afford, you need to get out of the loose of the elevated cost of health. All one is the very high agree with cost. That. And, and a very high hospitalization and various procedures. Can't Congress take up some some legislation or some uh, initiatives that would get at the cause and reason for our health care so much? We are. What is, what is well, and, and, and the reason that we that we can't do it in this health care bill is the Senate has some very strange reconciliation rules. So only things that have a direct impact on federal finances can be put in a reconciliation bill which is filibuster proof. What we are going to be doing in legislation that does not, would not pass the reconciliation test, number one, the House has passed a bill that takes away the antitrust exemption for health insurance companies. Overwhelmingly passed, came out of the Judiciary Committee that I serve on. Secondly, in order to broaden the base and broaden the pool, of insurance, uh, health insurance ought to be sold across state lines. You know, you can't buy health insurance from Illinois or Iowa or Minnesota. We ought to get rid of that and let the health insurance be uh, uh, across state lines, and that will there will be more people in the pool. We need to have medical liability reform uh, on this because that will get rid of a lot of the defensive medicine that doctors practice, uh, uh, just say, don't worry about it, the insurance will pay for it, 
and the chance of the doctor finding something uh, is less than winning the Powerball on Wednesday night. You know, that's kind of a long shot, too. And there are a whole lot of, you know, other more minor things that can't be put in a reconciliation bill, but which we are busy working on now. Uh, the thing is, is the news media, you know, talks about, you know, the big issues. I think these are important issues. The combination of them, I think, is going to help drive down the cost of health care. Okay, one final question concerns the health of the planet. Um, clearly, there is global warming and the scientific evidence that there is. Uh, CO2 emissions are contributing to it. What is the Congress thinking of doing to retool for the next generation of renewable energy fuels? Uh, uh, encouraging innovation into new technologies and then strongly uh, enforcing on uh, both domestic and international fronts the patent and copyright rights that inventors get for coming up with something new, number one. Number two, uh, continuing the credits for renewable fuels, which I have, and renewable activities I have supported. And I also think we've got to speed up the permitting for nuclear power plants because nuclear energy is the only way to generate electricity with zero greenhouse gas emissions. Marsha, is it Mole, Skyline Drive? I'm here. Okay. My, my comment has to do with um, an earlier gentleman's comment about your constituents. And I believe that these meetings are supposed to be held so that you can hear what your constituents have to say. And you said you had 80 town hall meetings, or how are they? I believe that the majority of people have spoken against the new health care bill at these meetings. And I believe that the, the political fact has shown that the majority of Americans are against the new health care act that you proposed. Even your own president has said that the House version of this bill is me. And yet, well, he supported it. But he did say it, right? Yeah, I did. Okay. So I guess my feeling is, you may have been elected, both of you, but we didn't know what this bill was going to be. We don't know everything that you're going to be voting on during your term. And so to say, well, you voted for me, so now I can vote any way I want, I think is rather arrogant. And I think that you, you need to listen to what you are saying now that these new bills and new things are coming forth, and you owe it to us. We aren't stupid. You owe it to us to listen to us and, and to change your opinion, not just go in with tunnel vision about what you're going to vote on. Okay. Mr. Gann, Mr. Gannon, uh, excuse me, man, that is an obstructive sign. I cannot see Ms. Molle, that sign up. Mr. Gannon represents 58,000 people. I represent about 710,000 people. Speaking for myself, the last three elections, I ran on repealing and replacing Obama. I believe I ran on repealing and replacing Obamacare. I was overwhelmingly elected each of these times. One of the things that I believe sacred is that politicians should fulfill their campaign promises if they win the election, rather than saying, I stand for this and then vote the other way when they get out into office. So I've been quite plain on the fact that Obamacare has to be repealed and replaced. I know that people who have benefited under Obamacare are not going to like it. Uh, on the other hand, you know, the best way we can get a consensus of this broadly based a group of people of the 710,000 people uh, that uh, I represent is through an election. And we have elections every two years for both his office and my office. Uh, on that. You know, and in a way, getting elected in a representative republic, which is what this country has been, is you elect us kind of as trustees for the term which we are elected. And to use our best judgment based upon all the information we get uh, to reach a decision on it, what is best for the country and what is best for our constituents. And I've tried to do that throughout my public career. But one of the things I'm not going to do is to tell the voters that I favor repeal and replacing Obamacare and then turn around and say, change my mind, fool, you didn't I? 
I think that's dishonest, and I won't be that way. Dale, Molly, same address. Yes. Um, back when Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, was first being discussed, one of the things that was coming out was we should have a single payer system mm -hmm. and a public option. That it didn't go anywhere because there wasn't a single person in the GOP that would support it at all. So it was, at that point, it wasn't in there. Uh, the public option in itself seems to me that it would control the cost of insurance because the insurance companies would be under pressure to keep their rates down. And that seems to me, instead of throwing the baby out of the, you know, the, the bathwater, why aren't we fixing the parts of Obamacare that we can fix yeah. and take them there? When you're talking about health care, whether it's Obamacare or Ryan's bill or McConnell's bill, uh, everything is kind of dependent upon everything else. And you can't pick out something and put something back in its place without it affecting every, everything else. Now what I would say is, is that the time Obamacare was passed in 2009 and 2010, what Republicans would have done didn't make any difference. There were Democratic majorities in both houses of Congress, and you know all of us could have voted one way or voted the other, and we would have been outvoted. What I am saying is that since 2010, there have been four elections, and with the exception of President Obama's re-election, there have been significant Republican gains in each election. Now, why is that? Because no, I will answer the question. <laughs> you know, and, they, you know, and that is, is because the public, that the voters were against the government overreach that they perceived that President Obama and the Democrats were having. And I keep on telling my Democratic friends is you've got to look at why Donald Trump was elected rather than complaining about the fact that he was elected. And the fact that, you know, this state went Republican for the first time since Reagan in 1984, there is something very basic that was going on in terms of why voters went from giving President Obama two victories which were substantial but not overwhelming uh, to voting for Donald Trump last year. And start thinking about that because that's why... Donald Trump carried Wisconsin, Ron Johnson was reelected. Yes, sir. Can I just make the last? Sure. My answer to that really was Citizens United. They have controlled and funded the politicians. Rather than listening to the people, we have to listen. The politicians are listening to the people who paid for all those ads. Well, you know, we had an election in Georgia. The Democrats spent twenty million more than the Republicans, and the Republicans ended up <coughs> ended up winning. Now, you know, the thing is, is every time we have campaign finance reform, uh, the cure seems to be worse than the disease. And Citizens United was based on First Amendment ground, and ever since 1976 in the Buckley case, the court has been consistent in saying that candidates who voluntarily put their name on the ballot can be regulated and limited, but nobody else can because that is a First Amendment protected right of free speech and free political uh, expression. And that's what the court has determined and Citizens United was uh, the, the last decision you know, on that in terms of a reaction to campaign finance laws that the Congress had passed. Uh, and uh, the court has not changed its mind over the years and over the differences of justices as some have retired and have been replaced. You know, we can be regulated, you can't. And, you know, how you want to spend your money or how people want to spend their money, that can't be regulated because 
The First Amendment starts out by saying Congress shall pass no law. And there's a whole string of things that Congress can't pass <coughs> laws on, and restricting freedom of speech and freedom of political expression are two of them. Diane is a Grunenberg of Hidden Fields in West Bend. bill funds the Portman Sense and Granner federal response to opioid addiction. That's one of the things that I'm quite proud of working on, which was passed and signed by the President. Secondly, as I said repeatedly, both the Senate and the House bill prohibit insurance companies from failing to insure people with pre-existing conditions and ban annual or lifetime caps. With Medicaid, uh, you either can go the block grant route, which I explained earlier, or continue the present program with funding caps. But there have to be funding caps. It can't be open-ended funding, again, because of the huge increases that are, are projected. And we have to do it in a way that is humane, and we have to do it in a way that is fiscally responsible. Now, the states run Medicaid now. There's federal... Uh, money that's in there, but the states are running Medicaid now. I don't see why everybody is so concerned about having the states run a program that they're already running, and that's Medicaid. Uh, it might be funded a little differently. There might be different ways the state can go about doing it, but again, the states will continue to run Medicaid just as they've had since it was first passed, I believe, in 1966. So. You know, you know, I remember when Paul Ryan ran for vice president uh, in 2012, the other side uh, put ads on where he was pushing Granny off the cliff with a wheelchair. That's not going to happen. You know, the thing is, is that if uh, we're able to repeal and replace Obamacare, we know that we own this issue politically. And that gives us an incentive to come up with something that is good, something that is humane, and something that works. And with 115,000 people 
ignoring the individual mandate and paying the fine uh, to the IRS, I think that that shows that Obamacare is not working, and the sooner we get to fixing it, the fewer people are going to get hurt on it. Now, last up, and we, we've gotten through the West Bend folks, but we're almost at the 820. Last up is Lorraine Henriksen of Ski View Court in Slinger. Yes, thank you. There's been a lot of talk about Medicaid tonight, and I'm sorry to uh, continue on that vein in the very last question. I'm not sorry to continue, but I'm sorry that I have not heard in all of the comments and all of the questions that have been answered by you, Congressman, this evening, I have not heard you stand up and say, which is what I want to hear, I will advocate for the citizens of Wisconsin. I will be their advocate. People who voted for you, Congressman, did not vote for the Senate or House reform of health care, as another lady pointed out tonight. People might have voted for you, but you do have a choice about how you vote on these bills. You could be an advocate. Sixty-seven percent of all people in nursing homes in Wisconsin rely solely on Medicaid for their health care. Yes. Yet every day, every nursing home in Wisconsin is paid $52 on average less than the actual cost of taking care of those patients. If Medicaid is turned back to Wisconsin and they choose to do the block grant, they can cut that Medicaid to those nursing homes drastically. My understanding is the current Wisconsin budget does not contain increases in Medicaid at all. I, that is my understanding. So that I am saying to you, what I am requesting you to do is be our advocate, to stand up for these hard-working elderly people who have spent all of their money, that's the reason why they're on Medicaid in the first place. They're not asking for charity, they're asking for justice and humane care, and you, I would hope, will be their advocate. When all of these bills are discussed in Washington, keep that in mind. These are your people from Wisconsin. They need decent care. They do not need cuts. Thank you. I don't think so. Okay. But let me say this. This country is heading toward bankruptcy. And if we can't float the bond issues to pay for all of this, then we're going to see a collapse, maybe high inflation, and we're not going to be able to fund any of these programs through the way that we should. That's why there has to be a balance, and I have to look at that balance. You know, everybody would like to have everything, uh, but with a budget, whether it's a family budget or a national budget, we can't pay for everything that everybody wants. I rest my case on the fact that the Senate and the House bills have a 50% increase in how much the federal government is going to be paying for Medicaid over the next 10 years. That's more than practically everything else in the budget. Defense, Social Security, you name it. So in terms of where the funding priorities are going, Medicaid is either at the top or very close to it. But it can't be unlimited because once it becomes unlimited, and you, the governments in the past have run the printing press. And again, I come back to when I first started out in this business, the home mortgage rate was 22% and we had double-digit inflation. And nobody could sell their house even if they have to uh, because they were moving uh, on that. I never want to get back to that because we, were in a, we had a recession, you know, we had to tighten our belts, uh, Mr. Volcker was the head of the Federal Reserve that controls the monetary policy and practically everybody in this country was hurting. And the consequence of spending money on ourselves and then having our children and grandchildren have to pay it back, you know, is something that everybody is going to have to think about when we're talking about funding questions. The federal government spends about $4 trillion a year. About 60% of that money is mandatory spending of the so-called entitlement programs. 7% is interest on the national debt, and only about 33% is with discretionary spending programs, some of which is defense, but a lot of which is everything else. So, you know, my job, and it's a tough one, is to try to balance things out. 